Hello, my friend, Pastor Kurt here, and you are watching The Bible Study, where we master the Bible one book at a time. We are in episode 9 in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, so if you're not driving, turn there on your iPad phone or in your actual physical Bible, and I am joined by another great, young, incredible leader on our Base F staff. You guys thought we had shown you all the leaders. You <laughs> thought we had had them. We had Wesley Town on here, episode two. We had Brandon Short, brilliant, episode one. Go watch that if you haven't. But we're pulling out the big guns this week. Another incredible communicator and theologian, Tyler Sweeney from our Orange County campus. Brother wow. Sweeney, welcome. It is, that's quite the intro, Kurt, but thank you. It's good to be here, you guys. I'm just hiding on the other side of the state now, but it is fun. This is an honor to be here today. We're going to get after it. First Corinthians chapter 9. This is Sweeney's Bible. You like that? That's a theologian's that's Bible. That's because right I'm there. traveling and this, I'm embarrassed. This Bible could both set Hurt you people. free and maybe commit a homicide. <laughs> Do some damage. Fell on someone. Do some damage. And so there's something good's <laughs> going to come out of that. All right. We'll see. We'll see. Let's get right to it. We're uh, in chapter 9. Like I said, we're going to go verses 1 through 18. If you would like to hear the rest of chapter 9, cool. you've got to join us on a weekend at Bayside where we're going to take the rest of the verses and we'll teach those on a weekend. Uh, without any further ado, set up the context for us, would you, Brother Swaney? Absolutely. A little bit of context for chapter 9. If you've been following along with us, you know how this runs. If it's your first time here, this is great. I'm just going to kind of set chapter 9 in the larger context of a 16-chapter letter, right? So you have 1 Corinthians and one of Paul's biggest things in writing this letter to this church, which actually existed less than 2,000 years ago, and it's still a city here today in the Mediterranean region, Paul is trying to unify a very divided people. Sound familiar? Paul is trying to bring unity amongst a group of a very divisive church because for a plethora of reasons. And he gets into it starting in chapter 1. And like Pastor Kurt just said, if you didn't get what that was, go back and watch that episode. And in the rest of the chapters, he brings up these different issues that the people within the church themselves are divided over. They're facing amongst themselves. But what's so interesting in chapter 9 is he actually uses himself as a personal example. So if you're going to zoom in a little bit more, within the 16-chapter book, you get chapters 8, 9, and 10. Okay, chapters 8, 9, and 10 are really talking about the, the idea of food sacrifice to idols, which was a contentious topic, because let's just agree, right? If you are hearing about this guy, Jesus, that isn't just a guy. In fact, you believe or you are being taught by this guy, Paul and Barnabas and Priscilla and Aquila and other leaders in the early church that Jesus from this know nothing podunk town of Nazareth is actually the son of God. He is deity and he is where we receive salvation and will live with God forever in heaven. That's a news blaster. I mean, that's a big pill to swallow. So these Early church members are trying to digest a lot of news all at one time. So of course there's different issues, and one of them is food sacrifice to idols. So Paul hits it head on in chapter 8, which was the episode right before this, and he's going, look, if it messes with your head, don't touch it. If you don't feel good about it, you don't got to do it. If you feel at peace about it, that's great, unless you're causing a brother or sister to stumble. Because if you do, you in fact are sinning, not just against them, and he says this at the end of chapter 8, but against Jesus Christ himself. Then starts verse 1 of chapter 9. And here we see a very raw, real, personal side of the Apostle Paul, where he starts out saying, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Do I not have the rights of an apostle? You get this real side of Paul, and he uses his, himself as an example to say, look, sure, we may have rights in life, but it doesn't mean that it's right to cash them in. Just because I can do something doesn't mean I should do something. Chapter 9. Perfect. As the, uh, Tyler says, he starts off with this great declaration, am I not free? And why do we do the context? Why is it important to listen to what Tyler just said? You cannot get chapter 9 without understanding chapter 8. In, in fact, that chapter heading that's in there between 8 and 9, that was put in by an editor later on. That's not inspired scripture. So an editor said, hey, I want to help people find this when their pastor's teaching on this. We'll put a chapter 8 here. We'll put a chapter 9 here. But honestly, what you really should do is read the whole of chapter 8 and then realize what he's saying is, I'm going to illustrate the principle Tyler just taught us about. You can't take your rights and use them in a way that hurts other people. And then he says, for instance, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not the result of my work in the Lord? Okay, let's stop right there. 
Okay. He's saying a couple things here. He's saying, number one, I am equal to the 12, and the 12 have agreed with me, and I am an apostle. We're going to teach on that right after I got through the verse by verse. Uh, Brother Swainy's going to come back, and he's going to tell us what, what that is. But bottom line is there's basically the gift of an apostle. That's what I call apostle, small a. And there is the person of the apostle. That's the apostle, capital A. And he says here, listen, if you're going to be an apostle, capital A, you need a couple qualities. Number one, you need to actually know Jesus personally. Paul met Jesus on the road to Damascus. Then you need to be able to work miracles. What is the miracle that the apostle Paul works? The miracle is the mm -hmm. Corinthian church. He's saying, no one thought you could exist. You're the most debauched, affluent, wealthy, unreachable, un-Jewish place in the world. And the gospel worked among you. And guess what? Do you remember who planted you? It was me, the Apostle mm -hmm. Paul. Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not the result of my work in the Lord? Even though I may not be apostle to others, he's admitting there is some distinction between him and the Apostle Paul, or the other apostles, Peter and John, uh, and some lack of credibility there. He says, surely I am to you. You need to be convinced based on the miracles you've seen me do and based on the fact that you know my story. Mm. For you are the seal of my apostleship. In other words, you're the evidence. The miracle of what happened in Corinth is the evidence that I truly am a capital A apostle. All right, let's go back to this thought. Here's the big thought. And you got to get this. Some people will teach this chapter and they go, oh, it's about finances. Yeah. Some people teach the chapter and they go, oh, it's about church finances. Yeah. It's not actually. Hmm. You can derive some good information about church finances. You can derive some good information about how a minister should be compensated here. Hmm. But the big thing you have to understand was what Tyler already told you. He's using this as an example, and it's a particularly potent example for the Corinthians. And I'm going to explain that why. And here's the point. Just get this in your head. Having a right doesn't mean you should use the right. Mm. Having a right okay. doesn't mean you should use the right. So Paul's going to say, I had this right, and I didn't use it. As an example, have mature spiritual people approach disunity and when there is actually care and concern for one another. I had a right, but I didn't use it. Okay, verse 3. This is my defense to those who sit in judgment on me. Don't we have the right to food and drink? Let me stop right there. All of these questions throughout the whole chapter are rhetorical. Hmm. So the answer is yes to all of them. So in your mind, whenever you ask a question, just answer yes. Rhetorical questions are a brilliant device. He's using them here. He's not actually asking the question. They're all yes. Okay. In my defense to those who sit in judgment on me, don't we have the right to food and drink? Yes. Don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us as do the other apostles and the Lord's brother and Cephas? Yes. Maybe we'll come back and do a whole episode on were any of the apostles married? Um, <laughs> or is it only I and Barnabas who lack the right to not work for a living? Well, that answer is no, but it's, it's, it's a yes and the opposite. <laughs> what he's saying is we have this right. Now, I got to explain to you what's going on here the second sophist movement. What these are is powerful Greek orators who were the celebrities of Greek culture. We've talked about this on past episodes and on the weekend. They were, they were the football stars, they were the basketball stars, they were the Hollywood uh, stars of the Greek culture. The Greeks were the one who invented philosophy. That's the first sophist movement. That's the beginning of philosophy. The Romans occupied them, suppressed that movement, and now at the very birth of the church, that movement is coming back. Many Greeks are saying, listen, we are going to embrace our heritage of great philosophy and oration. The intellectual center of this second sophist movement is in Athens. The presentation center, in other words, the art of it, the theater of it, is in Corinth. Hmm. And so what he's saying here is when these second sophist orators would come into Corinth and they would put on their show of oration, they would derive a couple things. Number one, they would derive uh, a support uh, in food and shelter. Hmm. They'd be given the finest meals. And number two, they'd be paid an honorarium. They would get a fee for their speaking. Mm. The Apostle Paul says, don't we have the right <laughs> to come in and get three squares a day, a nice hotel room, <laughs> and a fat check at the end of teaching you about Jesus Christ? Don't we have the right to that? Mm. 
I mean, other apostles are doing it in other cities. Don't we have the right to do that? And the answer is yes, they yeah. do have a right. Yeah. And there's an element of shame that the Apostle Paul is using here. Mm. The Greeks, this is a primarily Greek and Roman church. There is a Jewish contingency in here, a very powerful, important one, primarily very, very Greek and Roman here. They thought that manual labor was beneath them. Mm. Even those that did manual labor thought it was not an honorable thing. Who did the manual labor in Corinth? Slaves. Mm. Many of these people were former slaves going, I'm done with that forever. And some of them had owned slaves for generations wow. and thought, listen, if I'm going to sweat, it's going to be in the Olympia. It's going to be in the mm -hmm. races. But I'm, I'm usually not going to sweat at all. I don't want any calluses. I'm going to sit and think and write poetry. Mm -hmm. This was the Greek way. So Paul saying, I'm not going to actually receive an honorarium for you. I'm going to make tents. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm teaching you about Jesus. I'm going to take goat hides and <laughs> sew them together during the day. Well, and I'm not going to take a penny from you, even though it's my right mm. to take a penny from you. Now, the, the Jewish tradition is different on this. This is where the two cultures are clashing. The Jewish tradition was even the high priest would know a skill. The high priest would know how to uh, fish or to do agriculture or uh, uh, to be a carpenter. And so the, the Jewish tradition was, this is what the rabbis taught, if you do not teach your son to work, you teach your son to steal. Mm -hmm. So there's a cultural class going on here, and Paul is using the Jewish side of this to shame them. You've given in to celebrity, and you don't understand what it means to be a spiritually mature person who actually gets rid of their rights, even if it means hard work. All right, let's keep going. Mm -hmm. um, verse 7. So, so he gives this example about himself. Shouldn't we receive an honorarium? Then he goes to a common sense example. Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? No one is the answer. Who plants a vineyard and does not eat its grapes? Uh, no one. Who tends a flock and does not drink the milk? Do I say this merely on human authority? No. Now he's going to use a scriptural authority, an Old Testament example. Doesn't the law say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox while it's treading out the grain. Okay, let, let me just make sure you understand this. You got an ox, right? Have you ever been in a grain field? Have you ever worked yeah, in a grain field? Yeah, seen it. You're a southern cowboy. Yeah, I've seen pictures on Google. At the end of it, yeah. the wheat is really chest high. Mm. So you got this big ox. He's out there, and you're going, go, come on, we got to finish today, and work hard, and dig it up, and get it done, and cut it down. And the ox goes, well, I'm walking around. I'm going to nibble some of this. Mm. And the stingy farmer would go, you don't get to eat that. That's my harvest. Mm. And, and he'd muzzle the ox and say, listen, while you're going down the road cutting this down, no nibbling. Wow. The, the Old Testament says, don't be that guy. Mm -hmm. Don't be that guy. If you're working with someone, make it sure that they are well compensated. Mm, that's good. Do not muzzle an ox while it's treading out the grain. It is about, uh, it's about oxen that God is, con is it about oxen that God is concerned? Mm. Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us because whoever plows and threshes should be able to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. If you have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? Now again, is Paul teaching that a workman is worth their wage or a work, workwoman worth her wage? Yes, but it's not the primary point. He's setting them up. It's not the primary part. Does God say that employees should be treated well and that when someone does a service for you, they should be compensated? Yes. Does the Bible teach that bivocational ministry, making tents and preaching, is a legitimate model? Yes. Does the Bible teach that full-time ministry, pastors, should receive a full-time wage where appropriate? Yes, 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 yes. Don't let people get you on a side controversy here saying tent making is the only way to do it and full time is the only way to do it. Mm. It's not the point. Good. Both are affirmed in this passage, yeah. but it's not the point. He's setting them up. Mm. Verse 12. If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? Mm. He's not making the point. Why aren't you giving us money? He's setting them up. Are you ready for the setup? Here's where the punchline comes in. But we did not use this right. Hmm. That's the point of the passage. Yeah. Finance is good. 
Learn something about finance. He's saying, I had every right to grow rich among you. And you're affluent. You could have afforded me. And I'm a better orator than all those sophists. And I came with a better message than them. And not only that, I didn't just talk and teach. I laid hands on people and demons came out and they got healed and they got transformed. And slaves got free. And former slaves got free. And women got educated. And a powerful supernatural thing called the church happened. And it was my team that did it. And I didn't ask for a cent. Why didn't he ask for a cent? The credibility of the gospel was more important than his rights. Mm. Is the credibility of the gospel the most important thing in your life? Mm. Or, or your religious liberty? Or whether or not you're respected in your marriage? Or whether or not your kids listen to you? Or whether or not you got the right title or position in your organization? Maybe even in your church organization. Paul said, listen, I'm done with all that title stuff. Hmm. I had all the titles. Jew among Jew, scholar among scholars, zealot among zealots. Hmm. I'm done with the titles. I got one question. What will advance the kingdom of God? If going back to my childhood, now Paul comes from a rich family. Think about this. He actually didn't make a whole lot of tents as a kid. <laughs> he commanded, and his father commanded, and his brothers most likely commanded, the workers that made the tents. He knew how to do it. Mm. But he goes all the way back to the common workers and says, I'd rather stitch these goat hides together and not have it ever be questioned that the reason I came to Corinth was because wealthy people were here. No, that's good. I came mm. here because I was compelled to, which is what he says next. Let's keep yeah. going. No financial motive, even though he had the right to have one, and he uses the common sense argument and an Old Testament argument, and then he goes on, uh, and he uses one more argument. He actually repeats his format. So argument, argument, conclusion, I did not use my rights. He does the same thing. He does it twice. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Don't you know that those who serve in the temple, okay, here's his third example. So he said common sense, that's the soldier. Then Old Testament, that's the oxen. And now he's going back to the temple. What does he mean temple here? Does he mean the um, Jewish temple or does he mean the temple of Aphrodite? Yes, I believe yes. Mm. The temple culture is important to both groups. So he's like, this would be a great example. Mm. Do you know that those who serve in the temple get their food from the temple and that those who serve at the altar share what is offered on the altar in the same way the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. I have the right to get a living from you, but I have not used any of these rights. He repeats it. You've heard me say this before, but whenever something's repeated in the Bible, it's the explanation point. Yeah. Yep. It's the angry face emoji. It's the fire emoji. It's the hand clapping emoji. There is no um, periods or explanation points grammatically in the Greek. It's, right. There's no spaces even. Mm -hmm. He's repeating to tell you this is the important thing. But I have not used any of these rights. Mm -hmm. And I am not writing this in the hope that you will do such things for me. I'm not asking for a paycheck. Don't get, don't get mistaken. For I would rather die than allow anyone to deprive me of this boast. For when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, since I am compelled to preach. In other words, you may question my apostleship. You may have listened to people who question my apostleship. But I'm just telling, let's compare bank accounts. Hmm. One of us is doing it for the right reason, and some of us are not. Hmm. I did not do it for money. Then why did he do it? Why did he do it? Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Mm. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge and so not make full use of my rights as a preacher of the gospel. Mm. Let me simplify it. He's saying, so I can be like Jesus, who do not grasp at the right to stay in heaven, Philippians 2 says, mm. in his title and rank as God supreme, but instead 
became fully human and not just a human, a servant, not just a servant, but a perfect servant unto death and not just any ordinary death, but the death on the cross. Paul's saying, my boast is this, I'm doing it the Jesus way, the giving up of rights for powerful transformation. Here's what Paul's saying. I'd rather be compared to Jesus than have my rights. Mm -hmm. I'd rather people go, hey, he's just like Jesus, than have all of my rights. Mm -hmm. Now, I wanna make something really clear here. I'm talking about an individual. This is really talking about leadership here and setting an example. I'm not talking about classes of people. I'm not saying that all women, for instance, should say, I'm not worried about rights. Or that all African-American people say, I'm not worried about rights. Mm. There's difference in saying the class of people actually needs to be something the church is conf concerned about yeah. as opposed to you. Mm. When I'm saying this, I'm not thinking about you. I got to think about me. That's good. What rights am I laying down so that the gospel can further? Mm. It doesn't mean that everyone should, we shouldn't talk about any rights for anyone. Um, here's the bottom line. Here's, if you want to know what chapter 19 is saying, I'll put it in the most pithy statement of all, and then we'll get into some good theology and doctrine here. Listen to me. I have your best interest at heart, and my motives are pure because I'm doing it just like Jesus. Mm. That's what Paul's saying. He's saying on these minor issues, head coverings and meat sacrifice to idols, quit degrading and, and taking credibility out of the church. Listen to me. I did this among you and you saw me do it. Be like Jesus. Rescind your rights for the sake of your brothers and sisters mm. and be compelled to preach for the pure motive of seeing God change lives. All right, there we have verse 19, a powerful example from the Apostle wow. Paul for us. Yeah. Um, if you were to go up to the 50,000 foot level and take this right up to the, I mean, you got a few degrees behind your name, my brother. Um, what theology oh, should we learn from this example, the Apostle Paul's? Yeah, that's a great question. That was phenomenal teaching. Are you enjoying this? I hope you are, because that was some meat, some good content right there. And if we're going to zoom out 50,000 feet, Pastor Kurt, really the word that stands out to me if we're talking doctrine is ecclesiology. And that's a big fancy word that simply means the doctrine or the study of the church. And we didn't just choose that in praying over and thinking about this chapter because Paul was writing to the specific church of Corinth, although it does help, but also because, because it's very applicable to us today nearly 2,000 years later. I mean, you think about the power of the Word of God, the authenticity of Scripture. I mean, it is grounded, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and it is speaking to us today. And I think one of the biggest ways that it is, is it's showing and shaping our practice here in 2021 as the body of Christ. So one thing that stands out to me, and I wrote this down, is Pastor Kurt just talked about it, surrendering our rights for the sake of unity in the church surrendering our rights, right? Just because you have a right doesn't mean that you should use or exercise that right, even if there's good reasons for it. Why? Because the light should always be reflected back on Jesus. Paul had every right, every reason to claim some of his rights, and he surrendered, rescinded them all, and said, nope, I want the spotlight to be on Jesus. Have nothing to do with me. I wrote this down. We're called, if we're talking about our life and practice as the church, ecclesiology, again, the study of the church, we're called to let go of preferences in the pursuit of peace. We're called to let go of our personal preferences as we pursue peace with our brothers and our sisters. I think one of the reasons Paul wrote this letter, as we know he tells us in the opening chapter, was to help bring a group of divided Christians back together. I mean, there, there had to be almost nothing else that broke his heart more than that. To know that the, the body of Christ that was newly forming after Jesus' ascension back to the right hand of the Father in heaven, now there's divisions among this church. There's fractions among this body. I mean, we're just starting out. People, like, we, we have a job to do. We're called to reach the world. How can this be? And it's never going to happen if we hold on to our preference, preferences and prioritize those amongst and over above pursuing peace. Pursuing peace. That's the goal. So unity, coming together having open and honest dialogue about these things that might be aggravating us or maybe are offending other people, not letting, as Caleb Kaltenbach says, our divisiveness or our um, differences pull us apart, but actually bring us together where we can find some common ground that's only possible through the power of Jesus Christ. 
And there's a second thing as we're talking doctrine before we land the plane here with application, and it's apostleship. Pastor Kurt teased this just a little bit ago. But the question for us in the conversation of the church is this, where do apostles fit in in the church today? Well, as Paul tells us in this letter and in other letters that he writes to, he wrote over half of the New Testament, his idea and definition of apostleship is really twofold, right? So if apostle is one who is sent out, small letter A, his definition of apostle, one is the 12 apostles that actually walked and talked and did life with Jesus while he was here on earth during his earthly ministry for over three years, plus Paul himself. And Paul tells us as the beginning of chapter nine, verse one, have I not seen Jesus our Lord? A rhetorical question, but the answer is undeniably, yes, I have. That goes back to his conversion story in Acts chapter 9, where Jesus himself bucked him off a donkey as he's on his way to Damascus in pursuit of arresting Christians and throwing them in jail. And his life was never the same. And Paul says, I don't really care what you say. I know other people are going to talk and there's always going to be haters, but I am an apostle. I have seen Jesus Christ, our Lord. He has called me by name and I'm sent out or I am commissioned, literally the definition of an apostle. So that's one. But there's also a broader definition of the word apostle as well. And that includes you and I today. It includes many people living on earth. It's everyone else. It's the actual gift of apostleship for certain people today. Now, Paul talks about this in other letters. You get it in Romans 8, you get it in 1 Corinthians 12. And in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul actually says that the Spirit of God will send out apostles and teachers and prophets, and they will pioneer pathways for the gospel. That's really when I think of an apostle, modern day apostle especially, that's what I think about. And it's really from the model of Paul himself. One who is a trailblazer, who pioneers new pathways for the mm-hmm. advancement of the gospel of Jesus. One who breaks down walls. You come up to a barrier and there's plenty of people, plenty of people who might back down because of cowardice, sure, in cer- certain circumstance- circumstances, but maybe they're just not built for it. Maybe that's not God's calling upon their lives, but it is upon other people, specifically apostles. They get to a wall and they say, we're going to bust this wall down in the name of Jesus and make sure that people know and hear about his love and his salvation for their lives. A little bit of doctrine in chapter nine here today before really we get to application. Uh, you know, don't get, don't get um, divisive about the word apostle would be my encouragement to everyone. You did a great job. Yeah. Two definitions there. I do think there is a lot of biblical... Um, evidence that the the most simplest meaning of this word which apostle just means sent one yeah means sent one or or you could add commission sent one in other words we as a body of christ agree and you see this when uh the apostle paul goes and submits himself to the 11 in jerusalem and they're like yeah yeah you and barnabas two thumbs up you're sent from us and we agree that you're sent yeah. ones um all the way to what we see nowadays which is some people tend to have, and I, I tend to think of the category here, uh, T, as missionaries and church planters mm-hmm. or multiplying leaders. They're the leader that goes out and goes, you know what? I'm actually looking at that place over there. Marin County doesn't have enough churches. Mm-hmm. Uh, I am actually looking at every country that ends in Istan, and I'm going to learn Russian, and I'm going to go over there and do what it takes to actually bring the gospel yeah. to yeah. that place versus the person that does what we do, which is, um, you know, here in a urban center like Newport Beach or uh, you and for me, Sacramento, yep, totally. we're just we're having a regular local church. Yep. Um, yep, absolutely. And that was really good to point out, too, because all of us, if we follow Jesus Christ, we are all sent out. Yeah. Every single one there of us. There is an apostolic sense to yes. all of us, especially in the yes. middle age. Okay, 100%. let's try to get this really practical because yeah. you're teaching, you're teaching about the church and you teach, you, what I love about what you said about it, uh, the church is that it's a counterintuitive thing where we all are surrendering our rights yeah. in an organization. That's the, what bind, we surrender our rights for the better good of mm. Christ and each other. But that didn't always happen. No. I mean, it's so funny. This is so <laughs> main and plain to how the Bible sets up the church. Yeah. And yet, I can't, the music is too loud. Yeah. Music's not loud enough. Sermon was too long. <laughs> Sermon's not long enough. They didn't like what they did in the third grader room. I was not as, they should be having memorization of those Bible verses in third grade room. And it's, it seems like we've forgotten this and it's all about my way of the highway. And um, instead of this sense of surrendering our preference, I love that word preference used. Mm -hmm. Instead of surrendering our preference, it has, we're, we're Siskel and Ebert. 
Yeah. Do you know who they are? That's the old Yeah, I remember. Yeah, yeah. Who they are at the movies? At what the movies, yeah. yeah. So we walk out of church and instead of going, man, we're a family that has surrendered rights to support each other for the yeah. advancement of the gospel. We're like, yeah, you know, I give that middle school service, I give it, I give it a three out of five. Yeah. Started strong. Yeah. But I think the narrative got lost yeah. right around the game time. Yeah, we take it upon ourselves to become critics. How, how do we just, apply this? How do we get out totally. of that? Yeah, well, it's a whole lot easier said than done. I think we just need to admit that right off the bat, which draws me to a question that Pastor Andy Stanley, I'm pretty sure he coined this. He asked, what does love require of me? Mm. And I'm going to say that one more time, because every time I ask that question, it hits down deep on a soul level. What does love require of me? Not what's comfortable or what do I enjoy or what would I like to do in this situation, but what does the love of Jesus Christ, specifically the hope of glory in my heart, require of me in this situation? That's a great question. We gotta surrender, we gotta give up our rights for the well-being and the betterment of others. Because after all, right, contextually speaking mm -hmm. for 1 Corinthians, Paul is trying to bring together a largely divided group of people for the advancement of the gospel. And we're still on that same mission today. So a couple of practical application points for you. Pursuing peace over preferences in your life might look like not having a glass of wine at dinner. Can we talk about drinking for just a second? Even though you might think it's absolutely fine to have a glass of wine or a beer if you go out to dinner for date night with your spouse. But if you're double dating with another couple or you know there's going to be some people there that ah, maybe just rubs them the wrong way. Or, to this or they have a past addiction problem. Abs, 100%. Absolutely. They got, or uh, someone in their family has an addiction problem. You know in your good conscience that, ah, red flag, not too sure if I should do this. Don't. Because if you do, according to this passage, that's sin. You are actually acting in wrong. That is you choosing your preference over peace and call Paul's us to be peacemakers. Another thing might be theological debates. Next time Love you go it. to your family function. Do your cousins want to actually come up and talk to you or are they avoiding you because they know it's just going to be this contentious argument where you want to talk about every doctrine in scripture and you would rather do a whole lot more talking to them than listening and asking questions. Maybe you simply just need to talk about the latest episode of Ted Lasso and stop bringing up the Bible for half a second because you have the reputation in your family or in your circle of friends of being the one who always wants to debate. That's your preference. Maybe you are a debater. That's great. You don't need to do it all the time. You got to surrender that right. Another one could be posting so, so online. So I got to say, is that with primary doctrinal issues, secondary doctrinal issues, or all doctrinal issues? Probably all the above. I yeah. think it's A through D. I yeah. think if you, if you have this check in your spirit where you're just, and you got to read the room as well. Right. And you go, come on, like, are, are they feeling love? That goes back to the question. Yeah. What does love require of me? Am I loving them by pursuing this conversation yes. or do I need to pull out? There's a difference between saying, I'm sticking to this conviction, primary, totally. yeah, uh, and I'm going to bug people with it and harass people with it. People yeah. say, oh, they're offended by the gospel. No, they're offended by your attitude yeah. of your preference in that. And then w the reason I make the distinction is I see people doing this with secondary doctrinal issues. Mm -hmm. I have seen people lose family members over what is the proper way and wow. form to preach. Wow. Which the where's that passage where it talks about the proper form to preach in America? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's right back here. And oh no. First hesitations. Doesn't exist. But, but to them it's a primary doctrine totally. and they're blowing up relationships left and right. Yeah. All right. You you have a third one. No, I that's jumped so on good. It. I've often found that it's not necessarily what you say, but how you say it. That's so true. And you know this a well, whole lot more than Peter, I It's Peter. Gentleness and respect. That's it. That's it. But even so, if I go, my firmly held conviction. Don't cover heads, don't sacrifice meat to idols, and verse by verse expository with no illustrations is the only way to preach the Bible. Yeah. And you gotta spend every single word in Lamentations, you can't skip a single one. Yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's my conviction. Yeah. I am called to lay down my rights mm. in how I interact with you if you have a different conviction than that. Totally, totally. Because yeah. okay. like you said, it's a secondary or maybe even a tertiary issue. It's yes. not the main thing. And oftentimes thing. when people are uh, mean-spirited about keeping their rights in an issue like that, it's not really even the issue that's actually going on. Yeah. Okay, yeah, you had a third it's one. surfacing another issue. Uh, well, there's just two more quick ones I thought of. Maybe in your life pursuing peace over preferences is, is not posting online or not posting online nearly as much as you do, right? That's not a bad thing necessarily, but your passion is coming out and it becomes incendiary. And maybe even what you write isn't necessarily bad or you couldn't be found at fault for it, but because it sparks debate, that's mostly negative. 
that sparks more debate. And now the focus becomes on the debate and not necessarily even what you were raising. And the Again, worst form of debate, online debate and short little bits and bites where we can't see each other. There you go. Maybe yeah. for you watching. Is today, that a problem in our world, do you think? I don't know. People... <laughs> I can't imagine where we would ever hear stories of people getting caught in trouble. That's okay. <laughs> that. Review the three ways is... You review all three again for me really quick. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe pursuing peace over preferences is um, is drinking, right? Yeah. It's, it's not having a glass of wine. Or any license you have in terms of your personal lifestyle or consuming, yeah. being sensitive to people around you. Yeah. You know, a friend's got a health issue and you're pounding Twinkies. Yeah, right, right in front of them. Right in front of them. When okay. you know it's a temptation. So that's number one. Number two. Second one would be, and I'll qualify it with this, unnecessary theological debates. Yes. If you become known in your friendship circle, your family as the guy who's always trying to make a point and prove somebody wrong. Yes. That's not love. Yes. That's not and love. And number one, three is what you post online. It's very good. Very, very practical. I think yeah. we could have this whole chapter eight, nine, and 10 on those three issues for our church. I'll just put it this way. What causes us to give up our rights for the greater good? What causes that? My application would simply be Paul is motivated to give up his right for compensation among the Corinthians because he's got a compelling calling from Jesus. Mm. So what oftentimes lacks in the person that is uh, consuming or sharing or arguing is they don't, they don't have a compelling cause. Yeah. Or they think that those other things are their compelling cause. Mm. Paul's like, if this takes away any attention from cry, the cross and Jesus Christ, uh, woe to me. If I don't give up this right, I'm not giving up this right to make a point to you or to be fit. Woe to me. Hmm. I've been called to preach the gospel and I'm going to do that. I'll give up every other right to do that. Yeah. My, my thing is to tell people is like, listen, if you want to get into a mature emotional space, spiritual space in terms of how you treat people and when to surrender your rights and when not to, you got to hear a word from God hmm. about what you're meant to be doing. It won't be preaching the gospel to unchurched people for every one of us like it is for Paul. It might be doing acts of mercy. It might be uh, acts of generosity. It, you, you're, where God has you might be a totally different thing for Paul. But what is that thing you say, woe to me if I don't get that done? And if I have to surrender some rights to get that done, I'll surrender it every day of the week. Yeah, that's great. That's great. So what is that thing for you? Hmm. Maybe getting that thing would align your whole life and it would be easy to surrender your preferences. Hmm. Anyway, as usual, we're fitting the Bible study up, and I am feeling more convicted than I thought I would <laughs> be about all of this. Woe to me if I do not preach. I feel what Paul's yeah. saying there. My friends, next week is chapter 10. Tyler already gave you the uh, preview of it. There's some really, really meaty and challenging. It's challenging. If you yeah. want the cotton candy, you're not going to get it next week. If you want the challenge, you are going to get it. Do yeah. me a favor. Someone out there needs to hear this. This is exact word that's going to get them unstuck. It's a little bit more of a challenging word, but those challenging words often are the ones that produce the breakthrough. So I want to mm. encourage you, would you subscribe? Go to the YouTube channel, Bayside Church. Subscribe right there. Make, leave a comment. Leave a like. Uh, share the link. And make sure someone hears about the Bible study where we're mastering the Bible one book at a time. Thanks for joining. We'll see you next episode.